Uh, welcome and, and thank you for joining in to listen to my presentation today. Um, I will be talking to you about some results from my doctoral research on the relationships between internationalization and global citizenship in higher education. Um, and after Simon will, uh, will uh, uh, give his presentation. Um, Apart, uh, a few words about myself. Um, apart from my research um, and studies um, at the UCL, uh, my professional career has been within international higher education and most recently as a manager of global engagement um, at the Faculty of Business and Law at the University of Portsmouth. Today, I will introduce you to um, a conceptual model of relationships between internationalization um, and, um, higher, and global citizenship in higher education. Um, I will uh, then um, follow with a brief uh, explanation of the methodology for my study and then give you some conclusions and examples from um, four case studies in Brazil, Poland, the UK and the USA. But before that, let's just start with a brief overview of key themes in literature around um, internationalization and then global citizenship, just to set the scene and so that you, you can see where my kind of conceptual framework comes from. Um, so um, in the literature, um, um, there are various ways of looking at internationalization uh, as competition or cooperation uh, that are underpinned by different ideologies of internationalization. Uh, we talk about internationalization at home and abroad and distinguish between those two um, about internationalization of their curriculum about internationalization that is focused on the institution or on the students. Um, internationalization that is comprehensive, so um, uh, applies to the whole institution, that is transformative, uh, that, is, that is ethical, um, and most recently also about internationalization of higher education for the society or for global citizenship. So um, I'm just quickly uh, going to show you these, um, these key themes um, before I move on to show you my, my model, just to set the scene. Um, and then um, the literature around global citizenship in higher education, um, um, different themes will be around soft versus critical global citizenship, um, the influence of the Oxfam curriculum for global citizenship, embedding curriculum with global perspectives, uh, and distinguishing between cosmopolitan and advocacy-based approaches to global citizenship. Um, global citizenship in higher education seen in learning outcomes or graduate attributes. Um, and then uh, more recently, uh, the critiques of global citizenship uh, seen uh, more as a producing globally competent graduates or global workers. Um, so these key themes um, have had, had an influence on uh, the model of uh, uh, relationships between internationalization and global citizenship, which is what I concentrated on in my studies. So I, I will show you this model now. And um, here we can see that um, when you think about in internationalization, uh, what it can mean in an institution is um, either um, competition uh, and um, agenda of employability or leading to cooperation based on equality or seeking responsibility in international engagements and equi equity. On the other hand, the global uh, citizen, uh, global citizen uh, attributes uh, can relate to either uh, the concepts of a global worker who is equipped with global skills or a global cosmopolitan who is seeking for global harmony or a global activist who is um, striving for social global social justice. Um, so these different um, ideas kind of um, are um, present in, in different institutions uh, and encompass what internationalization and global citizenship may stand for. But when it, we think about uh, what connects these two and what are the relationships between them, uh, they, those connections become more visible when we apply lenses. Um, and I'll show you what I mean. So, um, 
under uh, if we apply a neoliberal lens, so um, a kind of a tool, a prism that will, when you apply it, it will emphasize certain connections. We can see that internationalization agenda based on competition and uh, global employability connects to uh, fostering the uh, uh, attributes for global citizen as a global worker and focuses on equipping that global worker with glo global skills. Under the liberal lens, internationalization um, that uh, is more about cooperation and equality kind of connects and links to fostering global citizen as a global cosmopolitan that's striving for global harmony. And under the critical lens, you can see the connections between internationalization that um, uh, has this uh, great focus on responsibility and kind of building equity in any relationships um, with uh, how this connects to global citizen who is an, uh, a global activist striving for global social justice. Um, so these connections or relationships between internationalization and global citizenship become more visible when we apply this tool of global lenses uh, of, of lenses. Um, and later in my presentation, I'll show you examples from my empirical studies just to just to show you what it actually means in practice. However, there is one other important element. Um, so this is a model of, rela of uh, relationships, but those relationships are very nuanced and very complex. Uh, they're not as straightforward as you can see over here. And what makes them uh, different and uh, particular to uh, an institution are four factors. The context in which an institution operates, so that's a global, regional, national, and local context institutional particularities so something that is you know specific to an institution people who drive those processes and are involved in them and the creative use of the third space and the third space here relates to this um, kind of space in between uh, where people who um, who share an idea or are working around certain projects like internationalization or global citizenship kind of come together um, and um, apply their creativity to reconcile the different tensions and actually deliver on internationalization and um, global citizenship. So this is the model that um, uh, kind of emerged from um, my reading of the literature and from my empirical studies. And I'll show you now some examples of how this model kind of works in practice. Uh, but first, let's have a quick look at the methodology for my study. So I conducted four case studies in four countries um, in these institutions uh, in Brazil, Poland, UK and USA. And I uh, analyzed strategies, missions, and visions in these institutions and interviewed about six people uh, involved in internationalization and fostering global citizenship. I visited all campuses and uh, did a thematic analysis of, my, uh, of the data. So now let's move on to the empirical studies so that you can see how this uh, model kind of applies in practice. And so, yeah, let's go on a tour around the world. And the first stop will be in Brazil at uh, Pontifical Uni Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, which is a fairly small, uh, um, independent, nonprofit, private and Catholic affiliated university uh, in, in Rio, in a, in a big metropolis of Rio de Janeiro. Um, and um, yes, this is, the result of, of my investigations. So here you can see the model that I showed you earlier, but with uh, um, adjustments to the, the local particularities. Um, and I just want to explain uh, what these tightly aligned and loosely aligned things mean here. So before I showed you kind of the theory, and this is um, what came out in practice. So whenever, um, um, there were strong references to competition, for example, um, they, will, they, they are tightly aligned basically to that um, conceptualization. Um, so um, 
when it comes to relationships between internationalization and graduate attributes, global citizenship attributes at PUKI, uh, we can see that uh, there's quite um, a lot of alignment uh, under the, the liberal lens and the critical lens uh, to what internationalization and global citizenship might stand for. Um, uh, but there is less, uh, it's less of a straightforward picture when it comes to when you apply the neoliberal lens. Um, and you can see here that there were not really many references to employability, global employability, or developing a global worker. Uh, on the contrary, actually, the, the global skills um, um, that are mentioned here were more aligned to developing a global cosmopolitan. Um, and the, it, it, so the, the model here, it's slightly different. And this is because of the four factors that I mentioned before, uh, the context, the people, the particularities of that institution and the third space. Um, and just very briefly, uh, uh, you, in the blue box, you can see that the, those um, particularities uh, are really uh, encompassed uh, under the Catholic ethics and planetary citizenship. What it means is that um, because of the type of institution it is, the Catholic ethics is important because it brings to the core kind of the principles of developing students as humans in all aspects, living in harmony with others and with the planet. And um, it has a strongly embedded kind of strive for global social justice. And the planetary citizenship is important because in this Latin American and especially Brazilian context, uh, it, it, is, uh, it, it focuses, uh, it introduces a different dimension to global citizenship. Uh, so those two, um, those two elements really have an influence on how the in, uh, relationship look like in practice at this institution. On the other hand, if we travel now to Europe, uh, to the University of Warsaw, which is a big university in the capital city um, that's been um, in operation for two centuries, we can see a very different picture here. And those relationships um, are slightly, uh, have slightly different dynamics. So we, have, we can see more tight alignments under the liberal lens and the neoliberal lens. Uh, however, the important characteristic and differentiating factor is the focus on Europe. And you can see here that European worker. So uh, that really relates to the particularity in the context where this institution operates, that a lot of the employability agenda, for example, is related uh, to, to, to Europe um, and the European Union uh, region. Um, when you, we look at the uh, critical lens, though, there are not as many alignments here, um, and they're slightly different in focus. So rather than uh, aligning to global responsibility or equity, it's more about critiquing the neoliberal uh, agendas and, um, and uh, really um, asking for respect for cultural identity. Um, so that's a very different focus. Uh, so these relationships uh, between internationalization and graduate global citizen attributes uh, are slightly different dynamic here and the uh, uh, European context is very important on how they are shaped. Uh, let's move on to California now. The University of California, Irvine, uh, which is um, a big campus of the University of California outside Los Angeles. Uh, and you can see here again that it's a very different uh, picture when we, uh, when we apply the model and the different lenses. You can see that uh, it's not uh, as straightforward, those alignments are not as straightforward. So we have some references to competition, uh, we have some references to uh, under the liberal lens to cooperation and global cosmopolitan global harmony and some alignments under the critical lens. But what stands out is that really there maybe are not as many uh, references to the global dimension of employability. Uh, and this is because again of this particular 
context and particular institution that um, UCI is. And this is represented by the two blue boxes here, uh, where you can see hyphenated identities and UCI bubble. And basically what it is, it refers to the fact that the, the uh, population at UCI, which is uh, a, a lot of um, immigrant population that have uh, hyphenated identities. So they are, for example, Chinese Americans and many others, and they live in this UCI bubble. And that will um, explain uh, why there maybe aren't as many references to global dimensions. So the relationships between internationalization focus uh, and the graduate attributes, again, are very different and the dynamic is slightly different because of the, the context and the particularities. And my last stop is uh, in London. University of the Arts in London, which is um, a medium-sized university focusing on the creative arts uh, scattered around London, the different parts of London. And here, um, again, a very different picture. We can see that um, in terms of internationalization, there are quite a lot of alignments to uh, um, internationalization as um, competition and looking for employability, to cooperation and equality. Uh, but when we look at the global citizen, citizen attributes, it's a slightly different picture um, and it's represented by this blue box which says globally network creative professional and this is the the global citizen that um, um, uh, is, is, is uh, fostered the, the attributes of those the global citizen that are fostered there um, and um, you can see that this actually applies to all three different conceptualizations of what global citizen uh, attributes might be so globally networked will be related more to the uh, liberal conceptualization of a global cosmopolitan uh, professional to the neoliberal conceptualization of global worker and the word creative really kind of brings it all together because it refers to all um, three of them and especially to uh, perhaps the, the uh, conceptualization of a global activist who is creative uh, and striving for um, looking for global social justice. And that came very strongly here uh, in this the creative uh, third space. Uh, at the university um, with a lot of uh, curricular and extracurricular projects around uh, that global social justice element. Uh, so again, the, uh, the dynamic of the relationships between internationalization and graduate global citizen, uh, citizen attributes is, is very different here. And the model is, uh, has to be adjusted to represent that. And that comes from um, uh, the particularity of that institution. So in conclusion, the uh, neoliberal, liberal and critical conceptual lenses help visualize the different connections and disconnections between internationalization and global citizenship in higher education. And what my case studies really show is how important the localized experience is uh, to understand what those uh, both processes refer to, but also what is the dynamic, the relationship between them. And that's based on those four factors, context, institutional particularities, people, and the creative use of the third space. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Monica. I assume that the best thing to do now will be to go straight to Simon and then have a combined discussion. Is that right? Okay. Thank you. Simon, floor, the screen is now yours. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I would begin by noting that uh, this presentation is based on a study which focuses on aspects of findings uh, of my doctoral 
research, which is focused on curriculum internationalization and global citizenship in an African university. Now it's a qualitative case study of one university based in Ghana. And with the study, I sought to address a number of research objectives. The first is to assess the policy dimensions of curriculum internationalization and global citizenship at the university. The second is to examine how lecturers view and enact curriculum internationalization within a global citizenship discourse. And then lastly, I sought to assess the views and experiences of students as far as curriculum internationalization and global citizenship are concerned. The methods employed for my data collection were mainly documentary analysis of selected policy documents, and then interviews with academics and institutional heads, and then finally focus groups with students. I, I continue by giving a brief background of the African higher education context as it relates to my study. Now, it is important to know that there are two main forces that are shaping the operations of African universities within the global higher education context. The first is the colonial foundations of modern African higher education, which means that African universities were established as colonial institutions. And this coloniality reflects today in the academic systems and then the knowledge paradigms that they use for teaching and then research. The second force shaping the operations of African universities has to do with the impacts of the globalization of higher education. Like many universities around the world, African universities are also responding to the impacts of the globalization of higher education. And so you have these universities engaging in activities such as uh, research and academic exchange programs, and then research collaborations at the international level. Now, within this broad background, I sought to investigate if and how the case study institution is undertaking curriculum internationalization and teaching global citizenship as part of its response to the phenomenon of globalization. Now, in terms of the conceptual framework that I use in analyzing and interpreting my data, I developed a framework that I label as a critical global pedagogy. Now, this draws on three theoretical perspectives. The first perspective has to do with postcolonial theory, which draws on the ideas of Andriotti and others. The second theoretical perspective has to do with uh, critical pedagogy, which is, which is based on the publications of Ferrari and then Giro, who are main uh, pu publication figures within the critical pedagogy discourse. And then lastly, there is the pedagogy of global social justice developed in the works of Bond. Now, what I sought to do with this conceptual framework is to first develop an understanding of global citizenship and curriculum internationalization that is based on the social and historical context of the higher education institution. And then secondly, I sought to mark out the colonial forms, the colonial dimensions in the internationalization practices at the institution. Now, com coming to my findings, in terms of the policy dimensions on curriculum, internationalization, and global citizenship at the institution. The first thing to note is that the institution has a vision to become a world-class research intensive university within a stipulated period of time. Now, this is in line with the emerging trend in African higher education, where many universities are beginning to position their mission within the discourse of global knowledge economy. And I think that this provides some kind of rationale 
for the institution to undertake curriculum internationalization and provide their students with some form of global learning. Now, in line with its vision to become world-class and research intensive, the institution has an internationalization strategy that is focused on strengthening international collaborations and also developing world-class and international mindset in its constituents, mainly students and then academics. Now, my review of the international strategy, internationalization strategy shows that it's mainly transactional and focused on academic exchange programs and research collaborations, which are mainly aimed at attracting international funding. By this, there is little focus on the internationalization strategy on the curriculum with no apparent connections with teaching goals and learning outcomes on curriculum internationalization and global citizenship. Now, as part of my study, I sought to map out activities at the institution that predispose teaching and learning to a, a global perspective. Now, my discussions or my interviews with participants revealed that there were a number of activities the, institutions, the institution was engaging. One has to do with the predominant use of foreign or Western textbooks by lecturers to facilitate teaching and learning. The other has to do with the training of academics and researchers in mainly Western institutions. And then there are international networks and associations to which academics and faculties belong to. And then lastly, there are staff and student exchange programs which the institution is engaged with, with the institutions around the world. Now, some of these activities are not directly related to teaching and learning, but they are considered as curriculum enhancement activities. And I label these activities as driven by a global coloniality, mainly because they are rooted in the legacies of colonialism and then also are driven by a Western global hegemony, which fostered a phenomenon of academic dependency on the West. As part of my conceptual framework, I also sought to understand the local dimensions in the curriculum in terms of the extent to which the curriculum of the institution is engaged with local communities. A number of, of activities came up. Uh, one way has to do with the, the production of local case studies and textbooks. Some academics mentioned that as a way of redressing the dominance of Western textbooks in the curriculum, they are producing African-centered, African-focused teaching materials to strengthen local perspectives within the curriculum. One other way has to do with local community involvement in the implementation of the curriculum. So local resource persons are involved in, in facilitating teaching at the institution. And then also in some departments, there are initiatives that provide opportunities for students to intend with local, locally based organizations in, in the, the, the country. And then lastly, there are student voluntary engagement with local communities. Now I label these local activities as a decolonial approach to curriculum internationalization because they mainly focus on strengthening the local dimensions of the curriculum and reducing the colonial dimensions in the curriculum. Now, there was a sense in which some participants expressed disapproval of the extent to which Western theoretical perspectives feature in the curriculum of the institutions. And by this, they expressed an interest in seeing more indigenous perspectives, more local perspectives in the curriculum. So I provide two quotes from my research participants to illustrate these contestations over the predominance of Western perspectives in the curriculum. In terms of global citizenship themes in the curriculum of the institution, I interviewed lecturers 
as to the extent to which there were global citizenship teams in the academic programs and courses at the institution. And one issue that came up was that globalization was considered as a, a key factor in developing academic programs and courses. This was a way of making these academic programs and courses develop the required skills and values in students as a way of preparing them to address the needs and demands of globalization. Some departments also spoke about the development of global leadership in students. Actually, a particular school has its mission focused on developing global leadership in students. And so as a result, it has a number of courses which have global citizenship dimensions in them. So for example, there are courses on governance and leadership, there are courses on environmental management, there are courses on climate change and sustainable development. These provide opportunities for the curriculum of the institution to teach dimensions of global citizenship. And then a number of lecturers also mentioned fostering responsible citizenship and developing intercultural awareness and understanding in students. This was a way, or this is a way of preparing students to be able to work in multicultural context. Here again, I have a number of quotes from participants to illustrate this point. And then as a way of addressing one of my research questions, I assessed students' views and experiences as regards global citizenship. Now, one thing that came out strongly is that students tended to position their professional aspirations within the international employment space. And to that extent, they demonstrated an interest in acquiring the skill related to intercultural awareness and understanding. This is a way of preparing themselves to work in international employment spaces. And then some students also express concerns over the socioeconomic determinants of global citizenship, particularly for the context of Africa. And they thought that not every person in the African context could see themselves as global citizens, uh, global citizens because they lack the capacity, they lack the connections to be able to identify themselves as global citizens. And then also some other students expressed concerns over the uneven and homogenizing impacts of globalization on African societies. They express an interest for discussions around global citizenship to be able to address these impacts that globalization has on African societies. So I have a few quotes from students to illustrate these points as well. Now, as a way of concluding, I offer two thoughts. One has to do with the fact that curriculum internationalization in the African higher education context requires a discourse of decolonization. This is, this is, this is in, in an ironical sense. Now, as I have illustrated in earlier slides in my presentation, academic norms and practices at the institution and in most African universities are westernized as a result of the colonial foundations of these universities and also due to the impacts of Western global hegemony. And so decolonizing these courses would serve to strengthen indigenous and local perspectives in the curricula of African universities. And then lastly, I should say that global citizenship in the African university curricula requires appropriation to fit the sociocultural and historical conditions of African societies. Now, within the broader theoretical discussions of global citizenship, there are some scholars who have said that global citizenship is a Western concept based on Western ideologies and values with, 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 with an agenda to Westernize the non-Western. And so they kick against the concept. Now I'm proposing that there's a way in which African universities can appropriate the concept in terms of aligning it to the values and norms of African societies. 
One way, for example, is to align the normative values of global citizenship to the values that are centered in the concept, in the Southern African concept of Ubuntu. I think this will provide some narrative to strengthen African citizenship within the broader discourse of global citizenship. Thank you for your attention. And thank you both. I mean, you've got a lot of uh, interesting conversation going in the chat, which is always a very good sign. And um, we're not going to have time to address all of the interesting issues that are arising. So let's get straight to the Q&A. Now, I'll kick it off by asking you each a question, and then we'll pass to our, our list of people who've come forward. And then we'll begin with Victor Karanan and then go to Vicky Crockett, who's, and Vicky's got a question for both of you, I think. Uh, and after that, Alison Leslie. Um, but my question is firstly for uh, Monica, um, very interesting framework. I think that's what people are picking up and responding to, uh, analytical framework that you've developed. And of course, the use of the critical and liberal and neoliberal distinction, very useful for people, I think, because a lot of us, you know, thinking along those lines. Um, what struck me about it was that I think you'd find that, you know, when you actually speak to students, they're not necessarily wholly formed by the by the intentions of the of the university or the government for that matter in each country about how their education should be understood and absorbed by them they'll probably have a more i suppose multiple and complex view we know that studies of um, the consumer ethos for example find that the students there's a lot of students are sort of touched by it to a degree the sort of value for money thing works for them but they're they resist the idea that they're just consumers and they've, they're doing a lot more with their education than that. And I suspect it's the same here in relation to internationalization that, you know, people are, have got multiple thoughts in their heads. They might be a bit of the uh, critical and a bit of the uh, liberal and a bit of the, perhaps a bit of the survival employability, you know, going through their minds. So, where did you collect your evidence? Did, I mean, you seem to have collected it from, you know, the, the decision makers, the managers and so on. <coughs> did you talk to students? That's my question for you. Simon, I thought that was great. Uh, and you're getting, the, like Monica, a very good response in the chat. And your point that um, global citizenship needs to be contextualized is very strong. And that's, um, you know, the sort of way out, I think, of the kind of trap we're in where it's either neo-colonial and global or it's local. I mean, clearly we need to be global, but it need, needs to be a different kind of global. So my question to you was, you know, taking your point that the curriculum is westernized, the networks are westernized, that people are trained in the West and so on, you know, that, uh, you know, where's the space, where's the starting point for a kind of decolonial agenda? Um, is there scope in Ghana for work for people at the institutional level working with well, firstly, others in the country at institutional level, and also people in other African countries and other emerging countries, so to develop a different view to the to the dominant um, Westernized and 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 colonial view. Um, so, Monica. Yes, thank you, Simon. Uh, yes, so I um, the study was focused on. Um, looking at uh, strategies of universities and then uh, the uh, interviews with um, people involved in internationalization and uh, fostering global citizenship in these institutions to kind of see where there are connections and disconnections between what they thought and what um, the, the university strategy is. So it, um, I didn't talk to students. That was not part of the study. Uh, it will be interesting, though, to do mm. such a study in the future, because as you rightly point out, you know, people might have uh, students who might have very different um, interpretations of these um, of these concepts and how they, they relate to them. Um, but and as you rightly pointed out, I think it's um, a little bit of um, all of those three, and mm -hmm. it just depends at how which kind of position you're coming from to see different connections. This is what I was trying to show in my model, and mm -hmm. I think that responds to some of the other questions that were uh, in the chat. Uh, so, uh, yes, um, no students this time, hopefully next time. Right, Simon. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I think at the institutional level, in my case study, there wasn't so much discussions around decolonization, mainly because 
there was no institutional policy that uh, is prioritizing the issue of decolonization. But then I observed a difference in terms of the, the, the faculty level. So for example, hmm. at the Institu Institute of African Studies, which is focused on research on African issues, there were ongoing discussions about decolonizations and there were researchers who were interested in taking the issue up. But then if you go to a faculty like the business school, I, I found that many of their programs and many of their operations were based on a neoliberal model with mm -hmm. a very little focus on a decolonization discussion. Within the African context, I think that um, much discussion is going on in the Southern African context, especially South mm. Africa. I think if you mm. read the literature, it shows that they are doing so much in terms of uh, decolonizing the university curriculum. Thanks, Simon. Uh, our first uh, Q&A participant will be Victor, um, Victor Cameron. Yes. Are you there, Victor? Hi. Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Victor Karunan. I'm a professor in social policy at Thammasat University in Bangkok in Thailand. Uh, it's good to be here, and thanks so much to Monica and Simon for your excellent presentation. Uh, it raised a fundamental question in my mind. How do we define global citizenship? I know both of you have two different standpoints. Your starting point is quite different, diverse. And I'd like to ask you, Monica, how, based on your framework, what do you mean by global citizenship? And I'd like to ask you, Simon, from your perspective in Ghana, how do you define social uh, uh, global citizenship? I ask the question because conceptually, it's important to see where we stand in terms of definition of concepts. Are we inside or we outside? Are we looking from outside in or inside out? And I think Simon gave a perspective of looking from inside out. Second, that citizenship is a complex issue that people navigate an identity of citizenship. We know I'm an anthropologist, yeah? And I know from my research and my academic work that citizenship is experienced by people at different levels. One is a local identity in terms of the community, their culture, their ethnicity, and the family and community. That's one level of citizenship. The other is national citizenship by holding a passport for Nigeria or Ghana or wherever. And the third is being part of a global citizenship. Yeah, and I think Simon raised some interesting points there. How do we navigate these different levels of citizenship when we use the term global citizenship? Yeah, so we know that, for example, Americans are the worst when it comes to geography, understanding of geography. Would you call Americans as good global citizens? And I looked, I looked at the quote uh, that you, Simon, shared. No, and I just want to read it out again. When one of your Ab Abugri, yeah, 01, who said, I don't feel like a global citizen because I don't know much about everywhere else. And coming to Ghana, there was so much that was different that I had to learn. So I had a big knowledge gap. I come from India. I work in Asia and I think Africa, Latin America, all of us experience the same, same, same challenges. There's a big knowledge gap in terms of our understanding of global citizenship when we come from the global south. So my challenge to you is this, from the global north to the global south, how do you define global citizenship? Thank you. Well, both of you, I think will be answering this question. I don't mind who goes first. Whoever puts up their hand first, I think can go first. Okay, also go ahead, Tom. All right, so I think that from my uh, research, based on the perspectives of a number of research participants, I think the definitions and understandings of global citizenship were based on the recognition of the need to decolonize that normative understanding of global citizenship that is dominant across the world. And so you have some students talking about need, talking about the, the, the need for the, the discussions to be centered on promoting African citizenship. So by that, they were reducing their experiences, they were reducing their understanding of global citizenship 
to the regional level. And so I think this was somehow opposed to the normative understanding that we have of global citizenship as is a pedal ar ar around in the literature. Um, and um, I want to add that um, what global citizenship stands for, um, it can stand for many different things. It's like a, um, um, in my research, I use this um, uh, um, metaphor um, by Ella Cloud that of a floating signifier. So it can attach different meanings depending where it kind of lands or sits. That's why in my uh, model, um, there were the different understandings of what it may stand for depending on what kind of ideological stance you're coming from and how you're looking at it. So that was the distinction broadly between the global kind of worker, cosmopolitan and global activist. So it, it encompasses all of these. And it uh, depends like in my model, which lens you pick up and what you what you will see, what sort of connections, what things will uh, come across more strongly. I hope that answers your question. Yes, you did. Yeah, and I just think just to add, Victor, just one Victor, more point, Victor, Simon. Victor, 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 I have to let more people into the discussion. Yeah, sorry. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Um, our next uh, question is from Vicky. Vicky Crockett, you've got questions for both speakers. Yes, I do. Monica, I am fascinated by the the work that you've done, and particularly your model. And I have a question about how you envision that, or do you think that that could potentially then be used to inform how universities, um, how institutions of higher education structure their teaching and their curriculum, particularly if they are looking to develop a specific lens. Um, can they then find themselves, if you will, on your scale and then say, we have a mission and a vision to shift to a different lens? And can this structure then help inform how they design their learning and related to students, could this then become a model that students might use when they are making a selection about an institution of higher learning? So what type of um, applications do you see for your model? And then I have a question for Simon about his work. Uh, thank you, Vicky. Uh, this, this model was um, um, developed more to kind of look at first, to look at what is out there and to analyze what an institution does. So it could be used as like a kind of the first step to map out what we're doing and what are our aspirations. Um, and then, uh, yes, it could be applied as you, as you suggested. Um, I don't see why not. I used it to more to analyze um, kind of the stat status quo and point out different, um, different connections. Uh, so that was my um, starting point with this model. Uh, Thank you for that. And then Simon, the idea that you shared about your conversations as it relates to how our concepts of global citizenship or curriculum design is driven and how it has heavily leaned toward the practices and the ideologies of the global north. Mm -hmm. So in your mind, what would be some first steps that we could take to shift that dynamic and to use the practices in the global south to better inform or to create a more diverse concept of how we can design? global citizenship curricula, particularly in regions, as you shared, that have been heavily influenced historically by colonial presences. What are some first steps that we can take? All right, thank you for the question. So I think that uh, one important step is to try to diversify the content of curricula. I think that for uh, most university curricula in the Western context. And for most Westernized universities, the curricula are mainly based on Western intellectual traditions. And so attempts to bring in perspectives, intellectual perspectives that are, that are marginal would be very important in terms of diversifying the scope of curricula in institutions. I think this is very important in terms of uh, decolonizing the, the, the curriculum. Well, thanks Vic, for those excellent questions. Um, what I'm now going to do, because we're running short on time, is bring in three different voices. 
and then give you each a chance to respond to them. So you need to wait to, for the third person to have asked their question and then respond. But so keep in mind, you know, what each person is, 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 is asking. So you'll be able to respond to each one. The first is Alison, Alison Leslie. Are you there, please? I am here. I'll keep it really, really quick then. Um, Monica, I'm just interested to know why you chose the countries you did and the institutions you did as your case studies. Was it purely for practical reasons or were you interested in those because there was some kind of differentiation between them? Okay, keep that in mind, Monica. Um, next question from Catherine, Catherine Herez, if you're there, Catherine. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you again for the, these interesting presentations. Um, I would be interested in the differentiation from the IHAS uh, concept, the international internationalization in higher education for society. Um, how would you define th this concept in contrast to the global citizenship? And um, in your point of view, how can higher education institu in institutions support I has or global citizenship. Thank you very much. Okay, now our third question is from Gertrude. Gertrude Cotter. Hi there. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, yeah, no, I was just interested in when um, Simon, you talked about the uh, Ubuntu there at the very end, and I just thought it would be interesting to see how not so much that model fits in with Monica's um, model, but so, but so much how they could be aligned um, and where you might situate um, the Ubuntu idea in there, where, where would that sit? And also, Monica, mostly because I, I, I actually missed and I apologize for missing the very start um, of your talk, but um, are you basing your work on Oxley and Morley's typography? Because it would seem to me this is a model that I personally would use a lot, and I think it's a very useful model, but there may be um, something that I've missed at the very beginning, so you just might kind of let me know um, where, you know, about that. Is, is it based on that, or um, what's different about it? Okay, so both respond in turn. It'll probably take us close to the very end of the webinar after you've both spoken. Monica, perhaps you could start, and then Simon will speak second. Yes, thank you very much for these questions. So just very quickly, why did I choose these institutions? Um, because I was looking for a very uh, different institutions in different contexts, different locations. Um, and uh, yeah, that diversity of it uh, in terms of kind of size, focus, uh, disciplinarity, um, the uh, uh, age, um, uh, all uh, location, uh, that was very important to me just to see how, um, how they will approach the um, internationalization global citizenship and the relationships between them. Um, and they were both a kind of uh, either leaders of internationalization or aspiring to be leaders of internationalization. And both uh, were committed to fostering global citizenship in different forms. So these were kind of very briefly the reasons why I chose these um, institutions. Practical reasons were important too, but, uh, but um, maybe not, not so. Um, the other question was about internationalization of higher education for society and a very good question and um, I, I wouldn't frame it as how does it differ from global citizenship but I would see it more as how this different look uh, uh, looking at internationalization from kind of this perspective of how it will serve society actually uh, leads to more promoting or embracing the concept of global citizenship so I would see uh, I would see those two as um, complementary and working together rather than being different. Um, and uh, the last question was about the Oxley and Morris typology of cosmopolitan and um, advocacy-based global citizenship. Uh, it was uh, a, a part of my conceptual framework. I did refer to it at the beginning. Uh, and uh, it's, 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 a, it's a very useful typology, as you say, if you, if you want to kind of look at the global citizenship practices. Um, and it definitely informed um, um, my model um, and, and the distinction about the like, um, different ways of looking at a global citizenship. So that would be my quick answers to the three uh, questions. And well. Well done, Monica. And Simon, I think you can have the last word in the webinar. Yes, so thank you for the question. I think that I, I would situate Ubuntu as a concept within the critical traditions 
in the interpretations of global citizenship, uh, mainly because the critical traditions allow for engagement with uh, multiple knowledge forms and then also multiple uh, traditions. And so this opens the door for understandings and interpretations which have been left out of the mainstream to be brought in. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, th I think you've both done really well today and we're very grateful to you for coming on the show and, and providing such clear, um, clear slides and clear uh, words to go with them. Um, and you shaped a, a very successful discussion with, uh, I think, a high level of understanding in this very large group of over 130 people. Um, so we're indebted to you and you're both welcome to come back into the CG webinar program with your further work at any stage. Uh, send us in, a, send us in a, a message saying that you, you would like to present and we'll find a date for you. Uh, I want to thank also Doug Bourne, who I think has played a significant role in framing the, the, the work which is we've, we've heard today and also in, in, in setting up these two webinars we're having around global citizenship. A lot of people working on different aspects of global citizenship. I recognize a few names in the audience today of people who are currently doing research in the same area. And there are so many aspects in so many ways, but the decolonial aspect is becoming more and more important all of the time, I think, in our discussions about global citizenship. We're certainly problematizing and opening up the concept of the global by bringing decolonialism into it. Um, next webinar is on Thursday, two days time, and the new geopolitics of international higher education part two. So the return of Emma Sabzaliva from UNESCO and accompanied by Carolina Guzman Valenzuela, who's uh, uh, someone who's been on the webinar before from Chile, uh, G. Rubin from, and uh, Lakshmi Bose from the University of Cambridge. Um, it looks like a very strong program again, and we look forward to seeing you there. So come back in two days' time uh, and, uh, and, and experience the new geopolitics of international higher education part two and join the discussion. Thanks once again to our two speakers, Monica and Simon, and bye for now. Yeah, thank thank you. you very much. Thank, thank you so you. much for having us.